Christianity and American politics. Why you cannot be a Christian and vote for the Democratic Party. Brethren, today I'm going to expose the spirit behind the Democratic Party, which has built its entire platform upon three major issues, abortion, sexual perversion, and lawlessness. From these three issues, being the major ones, derives many other deviant ideologies and actions that are opposed to the Word of God, that are an affront to Christ, and that are decidedly leveraged in a way that unless you are spiritually blind, persecutes Christians while mocking God's holy word. With that in mind, I want to introduce you this morning to a word that best describes and exposes exactly what Democrats are by their very nature. If you've ever scratched your head and thought to yourself, as you see the utter chaotic nonsense that is emblematic of Democratic politicians, the policies they represent, and the decisions that have, at least over the last four years in America, made uh, decisions that have brought about disastrous results, then you've probably also heard comments from others saying, well, they're just a very different breed of human being. Indeed, they are. But more specifically, it's vital to understand exactly from the deep-rooted heart of why we've seen such anarchy, such lasciviousness, and such chaos. It's vital. And so the word for you to learn today which I'll summarize at the conclusion of this message, is the word Nicolaitanism. So please write that word down as it's spelled N-I-C-O-L-A-I-T-A-N-I-S-M. Nicolaitanism. So from here on out, when you hear Democratic Party or Democrats you should be hearing with biblically discerning ears, Nicolaitan party, Nicolaitans, etc. I'll state clearly so there's no ambiguity as to my own position. When it comes to the issue of voting and politics in general, and especially the current most pressing issue of the American Constitutional Republic's survival or demise, that of the U.S presidential election between Kamala Harris and President Donald Trump. I am voting, and I am voting in support of the Republican Party. I'm voting in support of a party which by default means I am voting to elect Donald Trump, who will be the 47th President of the United States if God wills it to be so. With that, and to be abundantly clear as to why I'm voting this way, no Christian, no Christian, regardless of the personal sins and imperfections of Donald Trump as a person, could ever support the Democratic Party. It's simply not possible. And more pastors should be speaking out publicly to this truth. Our ministry is a nonprofit ministry. But to take things a little further in our declaration, we've put it in our constitution and bylaws that no pastor, that means me, or any member may ever be paid a salary and so forth. Because I'm not in ministry to be enriched, but to enrich the heart's of God's people first, and then those who are held sway by Satan's lies, 
in the hope of seeing God's grace and mercy. Save them. Save them through the preaching of the gospel. Which, brethren, the preaching of the gospel, the gospel, as the Apostle Paul testified, is still today the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1 and verse 16. Brethren, it's delusional to think that any professing Christian could even find this topic worthy of debate. I say that because the Bible's own stance on the evil of abortion and sexual licentiousness, for example, are clear and settled. There's no room within the historic Christian faith or within the doctrines and teachings of God's word that for the body of Christ, as Jude put it, have been once delivered to the saints. There's just no room to disagree. And if you disagree, you're foolishly disagreeing, not with other people, but you're disagreeing with the word of God. Make no mistake about it. What we're dealing with as Christians at this point in the history of America is an outright rejection of these issues as matters of premacy. You see, Holy Scripture, that's God's Word, that's the Bible, is clear that the shedding of innocent blood is abominable. Proverbs 6 and verse 17. The sanctioning of sodomy, which is referred to in our generation as homosexuality and transgenderism and the like, is abominable, abominable, and goes against created order and natural law itself. Genesis 1, Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, and Romans 1. There's no mincing of words, and there's no time to waste the trumpet blast of warning and woe to those who would crassly dismiss the truth and who would even pervert the truth by calling what God calls abomination love. It's not love. Such people, regardless of their politics, are liars who are deceiving and being deceived. So you better remember this, brethren. You better remember this. I see these liars every day in today's mainline denominational influences. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA as it were, the United Methodist Church, the UMC, the Presbyterian Church in America, the PCA, and the U.S. Episcopal Church have all become what the Bible refers to as apostate. They deny the very Lord Jesus they claim to follow. And if they're attached to historically faithful servants of the word of God, for example, like Martin Luther, from which we get the term Lutheran, they have so twisted and shamed that name to the point of arriving at a place where if such and such a saint like Luther was alive today, surely he'd expose them for the apostates they are and demand they immediately and permanently remove the use of his name from their own. These so-called leaders of such groups consist of sodomites, and secular humanist activists, and antichrist charlatans, many of which are rebellious women who are much like those cows of Bashan that the prophet Amos exposed and unapologetically mocked. 
Many others are men who are spiritually weak, like blades of grass blowing in the wind, twisting and compromising God's word in order to be favored among their fellow reprobates. Oh, they love, many of them love to be called pastor. Pastor, they love to wear big crosses around their necks. They love to play dress up in an attempt to hide their false doctrinal leprosy and character. But Jesus warned about such men who are, as he put it, like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Matthew 23 and 27. They graze upon doctrines of demons like cows graze upon grass. The problem is that unbeknown to them, as it is with cows, they're only being fattened up for the coming slaughter that the Bible warns about the day of judgment. The cup of God's wrath truly is filling up. And unless they repent of their sins, unless they through repentance and faith are born again, They'll drink that cup to the last drop as they cast into the lake of fire with Satan, hell, and death itself. Revelation 20, 14 through 15. Those who give a passive shrug or hearty support of any individual who believes these things to be good, or as many lost folks have called it, progressive, liberal, compassionate ad nauseum are those who are at odds with God himself. Such men and women are fools, truly fools, lying and deceiving, and blind fools. And brethren, anyone who claims that the Christian faith leaves room for Christians to support men and women who promulgate the murder of children in the womb are likewise at odds with God himself. There are a few common objections I hear from people who wish to leave room for professing Christians to vote for a Democrat. The majority of opposition comes from a negative apologetic against the Republican Party rather than honestly assessing the Democratic Party's platform. In other words, it's an exercise of many what-about-isms that suggests the Republican Party is not an option for Christians either. They say, well, what about Trump? Or what about this? Or what about that? Well, I must be honest and say that the Republican Party itself hasn't done enough to deal with the problem of things like abortion, for example. But listen, they've tried. They've tried and continue to try while supporting and even joining with Christians in that effort. Whereas Democrats would have a grandmother, a grandmother who stands outside of an abortion clinic praying and reading God's word, arrested. To be clear, this is not one political party versus another. But at this point in American history, this is about seeing good versus evil, good policies versus evil policies, good intentions versus evil intentions. Isn't that clear cut? Well, not completely because there are politicians in every political camp who will use any and all means to keep their voting base. Names that come to my mind are Mitch McConnell, who was a Republican, and Chuck Schumer, who was a Democrat. Those two men, in my view, picture men who get a taste of what they perceive as power and become drunk on it, failing to realize that their position is the electorate's power, the people's power, not their own. They fail to see that they're called to be stewards and servants of the people, 
But listen, they become overlords and despot, despotic maniacs who lust for the attention that comes from their seats of power. And we see this being replicated in the hearts and in the words and in the deeds of so many others who fail the American people every day in favor of their own selfish ambitions. And yet, and yet, by God's grace, there are also godly men and women within the Republican Party who desire to make legitimate changes on these issues and have in fact proven themselves to be consistent on these issues. But within the Democratic Party, not a single man or woman could be named. Not a one. Brethren, at this point, we've got to exercise some common sense when it comes to elections in general. We can simply look at a person's voting record, can we not? Because if they're soft, soft on certain issues in the past, especially these issues, They'll be soft everywhere else that matters to you and I. We must choose candidates who consistently uphold biblical values. Which brings me back to President Trump. Say what you will about the man. But you cannot deny that he has proven to be a friend to Christians. Whereas Kamala Harris has proven to be against Christians, holding us even in contempt. If there ever was a candidate for the U.S. presidency who would assist in ushering in a one-world government, who would outlaw many, or at least attempt to outlaw many of the things which we hold dear as Christian people and lead an attack against the preaching even of the gospel. Folks, it's Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris, who is by no stretch of the imagination an antichrist communist person. And so the only Christians who could vote for Harris, well, are not Christians at all. At the very best, which is the worst, they are, in fact, apostates. An objection I've also heard thrown out there is that the Republican Party is not really pro-life because of the policies concerning things like immigration, warfare, welfare, and the death penalty. Those objections come from a place of simply not understanding what God's Word teaches about these things. You see, border control is necessary. War can be just. The death penalty is consistent with the biblical witness and a welfare state. Well, it's in direct opposition to God's word and its teaching on the responsibility of the recipient of welfare. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be diligent in exercising discernment so we can avoid failures in upholding scriptural precedent when dealing with such policies. More specifically, I'd question anyone supporting a candidate who advocates for open borders, pacifism, and no death penalty. A candidate who promulgates abortion up to birth. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? I've heard objections by some people regarding the character of Donald Trump. In some cases, I can't really disagree at times. And yes, character does matter. But it's also true, and it also matters, that the American people, the American citizens of an American nation, they are not voting in a pastor. Do voters hold the moral qualities and qualifications of the man with the same expectations as they would their pastor? It's one thing to hope for, 
But let's get real. What we have to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is exercise again some common sense. But more than that even. Brethren, listen. We have to reconcile with things the Lord detests in men and women. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. And then we've got to compare how we see God working, God working in and through those same men and women. When we cast a vote for someone, we're giving tacit support for that individual as our representative. One can cast a vote for an individual without supporting everything that individual represents. Now that much is obvious. However, listen, I don't believe the line drawn between the two is as clear cut as many want it to be. I believe there's a fundamental difference in asking what the greatest possible good is as opposed to what the lesser of the two evils is. In the former, one is actually making a calculated decision on the likelihood of what genuine good may come as a result of their vote, be it the Supreme Court choices, legislative policies that uphold biblical convictions, and so forth. The latter is only concerned with making a less evil choice and thereby is concerned with having less evil come as a result. This is the problem with focusing on what you hear the fake news talk about, pragmatics. It can just as easily be applied to one who wishes to vote for a Democratic candidate. Are you listening? I believe focusing on pragmatics is misguided, it's uninformed and convoluted. It might be a logical conclusion for some when choosing who to vote for, but this is also where there's a fundamental, listen, a fundamental division when it comes to voting and the body of Christ. You see, people supporting the Democratic Party have elevated lesser moral concepts above others of a higher moral degree. Many are plainly ignoring that while all such moral issues must come into play. There are moral issues. The scriptures present as more moral, or I should say more immoral than others. You can't get much stronger language from God's own word than to specifically highlight particular actions, actions of the Democratic Party in both character and in policy. Words like abominable and detestable. Granted, there's a difference between one who commits three abominable deeds and the one who commits them all and aims even to pass legislation enshrining the right for others to publicly flaunt those abominable deeds. Both are wicked, yes, but there's only one person. Are you listening? There's only one person running for president of the United States of America who wishes to sanction the national slaughter of babies. That's murder. There's only one person running for president of the United States of America who wishes to transition first graders to the opposite sex, to uphold sexual perversions in adults, to condone violent so-called protests and anarchy, to strip away fundamental freedoms like the right to protect yourself, like the right to say what you will, as I'm doing today, freedom of speech, who is fueling lawlessness. Folks, there's only one person, one person running for president of the United States of America who is in favor, in favor 
of illegals versus the American citizens. To steal from American citizens and give their resources to lawbreakers. One person who promulgates ideologies diametrically opposed to the Christian worldview. Like critical race theory, for example. One person who embraces the tenets of radical feminism and more. Kamala Harris is her name. And she is a Democrat who represents a political party whose platforms, whose policies, I just read to you, are what she is an extension of, plain and simple. It doesn't get any more simple. It doesn't get any more plain than that. Now, there are practical implications one must consider here as well, especially when we're looking at the scale of evil and perversion built into the Democratic Party, a party which prides itself on these things as if they're virtues to be applauded. No, they're not virtues to be applauded. They're gross sins to be exposed. Brethren, as opposed to the Democratic Party, there are legitimate reasons you can vote for a Republican because there are men and there are women found within the Republican Party with a firm commitment to our Lord Jesus Christ. By comparison, there are no, and I say no legitimate grounds for a faithful Christian to ever vote for a Democrat. Because a vote for any Democrat is a vote for the Democratic Party. A vote for the Democratic Party is a vote, again, for what God calls abominable and detestable. The Democratic Party has gone on record defending late-term abortion. The transition I mentioned earlier of first graders to the opposite sex and the normalization of sexual perversion in adults as well. They've gone on record with what is explicitly anti-Christian policies. They come across as the political left, alluding to Christian men and women of faith as if they're the dregs of society who need to be tried, convicted, and expunged from our society. And they do that in the name of so-called tolerance. What hypocrites they are. What liars they are. What double-minded people they are. And the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Their double-mindedness about such things are common knowledge. And so there's no manner in which a faithful Christian can ignore such things. Such wickedness. The unavoidable truth is this, brethren. How we view politics, American politics, is informed by how we view God. Yes, by how we view God. There are secondary and tertiary matters on which we can disagree on in good faith. But there are also matters we're making room for differences, as some refer to it. You know what it does? It only gives Satan a foothold. It gives him an advantage. There are matters that Scripture, that's God's Word, firmly binds the conscience on and gives no room for differences, no room whatsoever. Scripture does not give room for the murder of babies. Scripture does not give room for unbridled sexual perversion. Scripture does not give room for violent looting and rioting. Scripture does not give room for competing world views. Scripture does not give room 
for leaders to abandon the safety of their people. The Democratic Party is synonymous with these things to such a degree that Democrats who have attempted to stand in opposition to such evil, and praise God there have been a few, but they've been pushed out of the Democratic Party. I think of RFK Jr. as an example. So I say this, as long as the Republican Party still holds men and women of a firm commitment to Christian ideals, then we, brethren, have a basis for voting for them. There's a day coming. There's a day coming where it may no longer be the case that Christians in America will be able to necessarily even vote for Republicans. But it must be stated unequivocally at this point. That day has long passed with the Democratic Party. It is not a party that stands in any way, shape, or form for the cause of Christ, but stands, or rather, is falling, whether they realize it or not, in direct opposition to Christ. Now, I asked you earlier to write down and remember the word, Nicolaitanism. And with that, I want to close my thoughts on why Christian cannot vote for the Democratic Party. And by default, a Christian cannot and must not vote for Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris and her fellow Democrats are what the Bible refers to as Nicolaitans. Twice are they mentioned in the New Testament, both times in the book of Revelation. According to Revelation 2 and verse 6, Jesus commends the Christians at Ephesus for hating the works of the Nicolaitans. Yes, Jesus does hate certain things, and so should we, brethren. They are mentioned again in Revelation 2 and verse 15 in the letter to the church in Pergamum. Early tradition among the church fathers, most notably Irenaeus, identifies these with Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch who was appointed one of the seven deacons in Acts chapter 6 and verse 5. But this is unlikely because the name itself, Nicolaitan, can be derived from two words which mean victory or conquering and over people. And so the idea of conquering or overpowering the people is what we have in the name Nicolaitan. They were licentious people. They were immoral people. And the Nicolaitans advocated an unhealthy compromise with pagan society and the idolatrous culture of Ephesus. The teaching of the Nicolaitans is identified with the teachings of Balaam. Jesus said, quote, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. That's Revelation 2, verses 14 and 15. The language suggests that Jezebel and her followers, being spiritually depraved people, fallen, damnable, demonic spirits, leading the hearts and minds of people, the people are those who follow that spirit. And they constituted a group of Nicolaitans in Thyatira. They're all said to be guilty of enticing God's people, drawing them away from the assurance of God's word, drawing them away to do what? To eat things sacrificed to idols. You know what an idol is, don't you? It's just an image that represents the demonic spirit behind it and to commit acts of immorality. 
in Revelation to fornicate, the Greek word porneo, from which we get the English word pornography, and its connates are metaphorical for, again, spiritual apostasy and idol worship. When these words are used literally, they are part of a list of vices in Revelation 9, 21, and 22. The Christians living in Ephesus, however, listen, they were not deceived. They were not duped. And I pray, Lord, help us that in 2024, for Christian people living in America, that they'll also not be deceived, that they'll also not be duped. You see, they were not so naive as to believe that Christian charity can tolerate false teaching. Because, brethren, we cannot tolerate it. And note the clear contrast. They bear trials and tribulations for Christ's sake. But they cannot bear the company of these evil people. They endure persecution, but not perversion. This is what I want you to understand about Nicolaitans. Jesus hates their moral and theological compromises, especially if it's done in his name or the name of so-called love and joy. Sound familiar? The word of God is clear that any appeal to grace to justify sin is repugnant to our Lord Jesus any attempt, any attempt to rationalize immorality by citing the liberty we have in Christ is abhorrent to Christ. And it must be abhorrent to you and I. True Christian love is never expressed by the tolerance of wickedness. Did you hear that? True Christian love is never expressed by the tolerance of wickedness, whether it be a matter of what one believes or how one behaves. The Bible declares that love, true love, godly love, love that is holy love, listen, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices. Brethren, thank you for spending time with me today on the subject of why you cannot be a Christian and vote for the Democrat Party. You can look outside and you can look up at the sky. You can tell whether it's going to rain or sleet or snow. You can tell and make a judgment of what the weather is going to to be. And when it comes to the issue of politics for Christian people, participating in the voting process, the privilege to be able to vote, we are without excuse because we can see clearly and judge a tree by its fruit. I trust that what I've shared with you today has been enlightening has been convicting and I hope in many ways encouraging as you search the scriptures, as you search and seek out ways to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, whether it's politics or any other issue, we exist to bring him glory. We exist for the glory of God alone. And so when you think about that as you cast your vote, ask yourself the question, does this decision I've just made, does it bring glory to God or does it bring shame and reproach upon the name of Christ and what he has said, what he has taught, what he has commanded, and what he has warned about? 
Because that's all that matters. Well, amen to that. And I pray that as you consider this most important upcoming election, that between now and that day, that you'll consider the importance of investing time in prayer, prayer and fasting for God, the Holy Spirit, to work upon your heart and mind, to draw you closer to the Lord Jesus, to drive you to the Word of God, to be taught of Him. I'm not your teacher. I am a man who is a sinner, saved but by grace alone. But I love you. And I want to be here for you. And I know that I can only do that as God leads other people like you to help me. So please support this ministry by subscribing to this YouTube channel, by making a financial contribution using our secure GiveLify link. And most importantly, by praying for me and for my family daily. This ministry, as we established originally, Covenant Reformed Baptist Church, has become essentially an online ministry. Our constitution and bylaws state that we, meaning me, cannot be paid a salary or anyone else volunteering in this ministry in any way. The Lord has blessed me with a fruitful career. And I believe the Bible is clear when it comes to financial remuneration that any money coming into ministry, in, in a gospel ministry, other than missionaries who are traveling and have no permanent home, that those monies should be used immediately for the benefit of other people in need. If someone calls me and says, as has happened not too long ago, Someone calls and says a single mom is in trouble financially and she's trying to do right and live right and help her children. What can you do? And we're able to take funds and buy furniture, bedding and groceries and some immediate essential needs that, that single mother might have. Someone says someone's in bad shape health-wise. We can, Lord willing, run to their aid and help them with the fellow brother or sister in Christ locally is not getting support from their congregation, a widow, orphan, someone in jail, then we can use those funds that come in and go and visit them and share the gospel and hold their hands and pray and sing and smile and laugh and bring the joy of the Lord to them to strengthen them. As the Bible says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. But what I'm saying to you is that we do need your help to continue this ministry. And I have full faith that God will do that, that God will move hearts to do that. I'm completely dependent on him. And he is faithful. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for praying for me in this ministry. Thank you for your financial support. And now my call to you, my call to action for you is this go and do the work of the gospel take the message of the gospel the message of the lord jesus christ of his sinless life his death burial and resurrection his everlasting kingdom take it with you wherever you go share it proclaim it rejoice in it and if need be, suffer for it. But whatever you do, do it all in the name and for the glory of God. Amen.